I know I kind of gave her a mini introduction before, but Jamie's going to talk to us about early trade beads. Uh, for those who don't know her handle, she's Bead Girl and what's the rest of it? Bead and Jewel Girl. Bead and Jewel, Jewel Girl. So tonight she's uh, short notice volunteered to speak to us, so welcome Jamie, thank you. So I am going to talk about portable wealth and adornment, so a brief history on trade beads in Western Canada. And um, on the cover photo here, I've depicted um, three types of European trade beads. So I'm also going to go into a lot of detail about native beads and native beadwork because, of course, our native people were here for tens of thousands of years before Europeans started coming in the late 1400s. Um, so they had very elaborate trade routes that were already established um, when the settlers began arriving. But the settlers brought some very beautiful items from Europe, and I've, I've um, put some of them up here. Um, so the red beads at the bottom are very prevalent <coughs> in North American beadwork, and especially in a lot of um, Western Canadian items that you'll see. So these, these tiny little red um, beads are called a white heart. And as you'll notice as I go on, um, they've got a very white core. It's a, a white core of glass that's made on a mandrel and it's pulled at a very high heat into a very long candy cane. And then they, they gather over it in a beautiful clear red glass. And um, the beads were used, these white red hearts were used quite a bit in um, the Hudson Bay fur trade, they were brought in by the kilo, and I mean like kilos and kilos for the native people, and they would sew them onto garments. They would um, do sometimes a lot of their own quill work and work with shells, and they'd incorporate these beautiful red glass European beads. Um, these were very prevalent during the 1500s onward, so during the fur trade, um, they were coming in mostly from the glass factories of Europe, which were kind of around the area of the Czech Republic and Venice, um, like the Czech Republic and Italy. So the um, traders would bring them in and they'd get things that they badly needed for survival in Canada's, you know, cold climate. They would get furs, beautiful pelts of beaver. Um, they would get skins, you know, like the buffalo. Like they would um, take these furs back to Europe and, and trade them, obviously. So, so bringing these beads over to the natives allowed the natives to decorate their costumes and um, the trail design of red beads are called Cornelian de Lepo. So these beads are named after Carnelian, Cornelian. Um, often beads imitate natural objects like corals or Carnelian. And then on your, on your left side um, is basically the king of all the trade beads, the chevron, which is um, built of a white core and then some blue and then some red and then another core of white and then it's um, pulled in very long canes like in these furnaces in Venice made into these beautiful beads but they take so long to make and so long to draw the glass that only the richest people would own these cobalt blue chevrons so usually it was people who had access, unfortunately, to slaves or they had a lot of material wealth and they were then giving these beads to the traders to bring into the new world. So if you find an authentic cobalt blue chevron, it's usually coming into North America around the time of Christopher Columbus, which, you know, like it's coming in when the beginning of European trade started up. 
and that was basically 1500 onward. So they are creating copies of the all of these beads now. Um, it's very prevalent to see copies made in India, made in China, but they'll be lightweight. They won't have the same layering. Um, if you look at one of these beads on the side view, you'll see all the beautiful building up of the glass that's in the cane, and you don't get that with um, artificial copies. All right, so this is one of the most important pictures. Um, this is the cover of a book, Trade and Ornaments, of um, our Aboriginal peoples. So indigenous trade was hugely prevalent um, for 10,000, maybe 20,000 years when our, our settle, settlement communities started coming into North America. Um, the natives had very elaborate trade routes. A vast network of goods found their way from one coast to another coast, from river valleys to plains to Arctic settlements. Native battles and acquisitions were worn um, and they were showing the framework of life and the accumulation of wealth. Warring tribes were a reality, just as was peaceful coexistence um, in Canada, you know, like in our land, in North America, and also down into South America. Intermarriages were happening between tribal communities. Um, the first people had rituals and rites of life that they echoed in very elaborate beating techniques. Men developed hunting and trapping and women excelled with preparing their husbands for survival in the cold and treacherous terrain of Canada's north. So archeologists continually unearth old money, old seashells, wood, feathers, things that originated from more southerly locales that were traded up into the north long before the Europeans arrived with um, the glass and the more, you know, the, the more mechanized equipment. So this picture is very significant because um, many of our native cultures are um, basically matriarchal and when a, a child is born and they look into their mother's eyes that knowledge of truth and of survival um, is kind of bestowed upon every young person because they feel safe they're wrapped in their mom's arms and they do say that beads beautiful objects and adornments um, are related to the human eye. So if you wear a talisman or a bead <coughs> that is um, meaningful to you, then you're reflecting like the good of God and um, something protective on your body so that evil spirits will be deflected um, if you ever get that from someone who's looking upon you in that way. So another important thing to note from this, this photo is that the, the mother in this picture has her baby sort of surrounded in um, swaddling items, a beautiful blanket. The, the woman is wearing, you know, a beautiful leather outfit and she's adorned in beads. And then above the child, um, you see these, these objects which are actually related to Christianity. So, so this is an example of um, Native people sort of allowing Christian faith into their life with the onset of the settlers. So it's believed that bead trading was one of the reasons why humans developed language. Beads are said to have been used and traded for most of the, our history. The oldest beads found to date were in Lombos Cave, 72,000 years old, in Lebanon about 40,000 years ago. 
So the beads you might wear around your neck um, represent prayers. And the Middle English word for bead is to bid or to pray. So when we hold objects, you know, small perforated beads in our, in our hands, we're creating a, um, you know, an idea or a thought process related to language through that. I'm not Catholic, but don't they have Catholic prayer beads, I believe? That's a strong prayer statement. Um, Catholic prayer beads were often made of natural materials. Okay. So rosaries yeah. actually were made of rose petals at one time. Okay. Um, so yes, every culture, it's kind of a universal thing that every culture has developed this as a way to um, like create an oral history or a history. So let's see here. Okay, so um, the Dutch, when they explored, when they started coming into Canada, brought Copenhagen cigarettes and you know, and beautiful Dutch glass trade beads. And this is an example of a young Cree child wearing really beautiful beadwork. Um, but also the jingle, the jingle dress. So that is a um, garment that's you know covered in the beautiful um, tin can tops of the Copenhagen cigarettes, and so that was brought by the Europeans. However, um, our native people were growing their own crops. They were smoking their own cigarettes. They had all that stuff. So you know, it's not like we brought tobacco and stuff like that because they were actually. They were growing their own crops long before Europeans got here, but it was the fact that these these objects and these types of metal were so prevalent with the European settlers and the European traders that they were able to um, work it into the ceremonial dance of their costumes and the rites of passage of you know different customs and different dances that they would have. Um, so this is a photo just of some of my collection um, on the strap of tan leather there. Those would be typical of some other forms of Hudson Bay beads or trade beads. So they're made out of glass. Um, they're large enough to fit onto leather and they are brought mainly from the Czech Republic. There's, there's a place in, the, in Czech that's called Jablonex or Jablonets, and a lot of our um, bulk of <coughs> trade beads or beads used by the natives would come from the Czech Republic. They'd be sold in really, really thick skeins or hanks, and the women would be able to gently take this apart and, and lightly put a needle through it and then sew it into clothing. So they were quite skilled, native women, um, with sewing and with making garments. These are some photos of probably mostly Plains native people wearing a lot of items from the 1800s that were their own indigenous trade items. So shell, of course, is hugely prominent. Um, dentalium shells are a type of mollusk seashell that comes from the west coast. It's so prevalent in, in prairie as well as like east garments. So um, the dentalium shells were nice and lightweight. There were there were millions and millions and millions of them um, in the west coast along the, the shores of the, the ocean. And entire communities are, native communities are actually built on top of piles of seashells or piles of bone as we know. So they were utilizing the objects from nature to make these beautiful garments and also things that were lightweight, things that were easy to, to take with you, easy to trade, easy to use as money. Um, porcupine quills were quite, quite prevalent, you know, and used maybe before the glass seed beads from the Czech Republic 
you know, came in. So porcupine quills and quill work, I might have an example of that. Um, I, later I will, um, were so time consuming. Like the women that did the quill work and it, it just, it took so many hours to do it and the, the quills were very fragile because they're tiny and narrow and organic and you had to boil them to get the marrow to come out of them and have them harden up so you could sew them as beads. So having these, these traders come in with the Czech glass beads was like so awesome for these women that were sewing these elaborate outfits. So important that the men, the traders, brought them on charts. So up in the corner of this photo is, is a really beautiful example of a very, very old book that is bead charts. So you'd get a sample from the factory, they'd, they'd show to your group, you know, what different glass beads were available. Um, these beads up on this chart are very special, so if they are used in planes beadwork or, um, you know, they'll be very, very scarce in, in a pattern. Um, what you'll see mostly are the tiny little seed beads and then you might see like one or two beads that have dots or stratified eyes on them or things like that. So that's that example. And then down at the bottom where you see um, the strings and strings of beads, that's, that's again what is brought from the Czech Republic. So those were sold by the kilo. Um, brought over in huge barrels, huge, like on boats, and um, we know, of course, our native beadwork, you know, to be so colorful and so beautiful, and um, so these are again a mix of some rare European beads mixed with the dentalium shells. Um, then our blue beads in this picture are Russian blue, so cobalt Russian blue beads, which were hand faceted and hand cut on a machine. So the labor involved with making these was very, very, like took a long time. So they were worth quite a bit and you could get a lot of, a lot of trade goods in exchange for those types of beads. So this is, primarily planes beadwork, I believe, um, on moccasins. So this would be on um, buffalo hide or leather. So that's an example there. Um, some pinched chevrons, which are the green beads. Again, a very important monetary bead in North America, used in a lot of Native, native work. And then um, beside this is an example of some of the very special glass beads that you would see. And um, it's always important to know that you're touching glass and that you're touching something that's been pulled and pulled and pulled by a skilled um, glass worker who's melted it at just the perfect temperature and has ground it down and, and helped make it into these. You know, it's not items that are stamped out or hand-painted. These are all completely handmade. And um, some of the most important beads or the most prevalent beads in all of our world aesthetic would be eye beads. So anything with a dot or a stratified eye on it. Venetian, Venetian beads are kind of a, a good example of an eye bead. Um, you probably look at this and you see the dots of color. So it took time and it took technology to build up the glass to make these beautiful, beautiful beads. And um, they're related to the idea of deflecting, you know, the evil eye. So also what's very prevalent um, is copies. So as you can see, like, Turquoise is so beautiful and it's available in North America, but we've often made a glass 
copy of turquoise. Um, we do that because it's very time consuming to mine and to go and to carve turquoise, whereas you can make glass beads and, and decorate with those instead. So of course both are worth, you know, being considered as trade objects. Stone is just as important as, as glass. Just stone is actually, um, would be weighed more in carats and um, would be more expensive than glass. Glass was what was readily available and utilized the most. So that's a close up of um, blue Hudson Bay trading beads. So you see every, every time you go to the stampede, everyone's decked out with the scarves on that have the plastic beads hanging off of them. Many of you probably have that in your closet at home. Um, this is the authentic version of that. So um, if you were wearing something that was culturally authentic, you would be wearing beautiful glass beads on your bandana um, to the stampede, for instance. This is a Blackfoot belt, which was used, um, the natives often used their own beautiful work as, as a way of agreeing to treaties and land claims. So often the Blackfoot would give a belt as a, as a token of a treaty being agreed upon for, for land. And shells, so of course that's, you know, shells have always been so easy to carve into. They're like talc. They were the very first money that any people, tribal people, or anyone used. Um, eye beads. So I talked a little bit about eye beads, and I actually wrote something about it here, so I'll read it to you if I can find the page. Like I was saying earlier, um, eye beads are cross-cultural. They're everywhere in the world. They're even the reason that we wear gemstones and jewelry today. Um, it's, it's a token of protection. So they're a global aesthetic. Um, it's a sign that you're being protected by um, an all-seeing protective eye. So. Um, the, the protection is symbolized through the wearing of pierced or stratified round objects and the portable pleasing shape of a bead represents usually the eyes of a mother to a child or um, that kind of thing. So the more sought after, the more technology that goes into making these beautiful glass beads um, like for instance, the, the red one up at the top with the, the pulled glass, like leaves and little seeds, you know, it's, it takes a lot of um, skill to make a bead like that. So that would be worn very prominently by someone and they'd pay a lot for it and they'd, they'd put it with probably copper and brass and gold or, you know, things that were more expensive because it took a lot of technology to make that. So I hope I've kind of given you <laughs> a good, a good um, overview on world beads. And I did bring quite a bit here as well that you can look at at the front. And did anyone have any questions? No. Yeah? What would be some key characteristics if you're looking at a pile of beads, how do you differentiate between a modern bead and, a, and an antique bead? Is it yeah. a white core or with the eyes? What would it, what would it be? Yeah, so as, as we get sort of more, well, things in the past were always more expensive, more beautiful. We used 
real stones, real like glass that was very dense. Um, when you look at, at trade beads and shells, there's often, um, there's like a lot of breaks in the glass. There's a lot of dust caught in it. I've actually done um, black and white photography where I've just exposed a lot of old artifacts to light and you can see the winding of the glass like it's been gathered and made by hand and you can see bubbles in it and you can see like fragments of dust and you're only going to see that in like items that are hundreds of years old you know you're not necessarily going to see that in new beads that are being manufactured today so Today, we're, we're seeing more um, mass production in China and India. Um, there are still a lot of glass beads in production, but they, they're not made in the same way. Um, they don't have as many layers of color. Um, they're not as dense of a glass. They're not as heavy. And they, they are very cheap. The colors aren't going to have as many beautiful colors as we can choose from if we're using these, you know, items and <coughs> that come from native trade or that come from um, European factories. So I used to work in a boutique where, where native people would shop a lot for their, um, their glass beads to put onto clothing and of course they would buy them by the kilo so they would come in these huge huge bags and they would buy nylon thread and really awesome needles and everything to help them do their sewing and um, they'd have to order those beads in because they'd need them by you know like 10 kilos of them or you know of one color and five kilos of another and and um, they're coming mostly from the Czech Republic and from Europe, so, so they're kind of import goods. Like the most beautiful, most sought after beads are brought from the most far of locales. And that's often in our society what is most valued to us is, well, if we're gonna have coral, we're gonna have the best coral that comes all the way from the Mediterranean. Like why festoon yourself in coral if you can't have that coral, you know, like, and with our, our native people, it was the same. They wanted, you know, the, the most beautiful trade goods and items to, to wear in their dances and their ceremonies because they wanted to show their wealth and they wanted to be able to wear that wealth and, and show it off in different um, events and customs. So can you answer a test? I think what he's asking is there's some kind of a Yes, I know some people bite them, mm -hmm. and they can tell when they bite them by the sound or the pressure they get through there that they're plastic oh, yeah. or they're glass. Yeah. Right. Oh, glass will always, glass feels like you're bumping against someone else's teeth, right? right. Like yeah. you're, yeah, and bone and things like that. Like plastic, of course, is warm and it feels, you can just tell plastic right away, you know, like that's the way of telling. And it's also the weight. So. We're talking about a time period, you know, from like the 1400s till now. <coughs> trade goods were always weighed on a weigh scale. Everything was by grams or kilo or carats. Um, it, the whole monetary system was completely different. Like it was, how much of this can I get for some of that, right? Like it was face-to-face. Um, -face. It was a very personal conversation and that's the difference with money money is very um, cut and dry it's very basic right but a lot of the reason why our native people don't have the things that they owned when the white people first came here was because we sort of we duped them out of a lot of their their land and their goods by by just creating, making things that they thought were beautiful that they could festoon themselves, you know. So there's a lot to it, mm -hmm. yeah. Jamie, another way of telling the difference, because I used to do a snap that we had all the stone beads, like the Gullian beads, the difference between the plastic ones, and there's a difference in plastic now and then, mm -hmm. but at that time we would heat a pin, 
I put it against the plastic, and you can see whether it's a real Boolean bead, which is stolen, as compared to a plastic bead. But, you know, that's what you <coughs> there. I don't know if the same applies now, but 30 years ago, if you took a hot pin and put it against the, the bead, if it was plastic, it would just go right into it, right away, or give a little bit of a bark on it. The actual spoon beads, you would never get that. Exactly. So yeah. These are glass, slightly different too. Yeah. 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 The early natives into body piercing. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, they were. I mean, the pictures I showed of the the mother, even with the child, had she had just huge amounts of these beautiful, like silver and shell and porcupine quill earrings, like all. And of course, yeah, even in times of of warring tribes, you know, being against another group or wanting the women or the assets that another group had, you would you would go in and you would try to um, scare off your opponent, right? Like there there's so much to it. It's it's um, pretty involved. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jamie, I thank you very much because we have a show.